a marine biologist encounters something horrifying while exploring the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. Over the course of the last few weeks of training, Booker memorized nearly every facet of the Tuscany. It was a remarkable feat of engineering, could withstand more water pressure than the sea could muster up at any achievable depth. And inside this matrix of layered syntactic foam, he would follow the ballast to the gratuitous and unexplored depths of Higgins Maw. He started the separation sequence, and the deep diver fell away from the escort and dipped beneath the surface of the Pacific. Then it was consumed in a whole new world, albeit one he'd frequented, that of the sea. Schools of fish swam by him, and when their cloud passed through a sunbeam, it glinted silver, and out in the rocks crawled the crustaceans that spruced up all the whitewashed stones like holiday ornaments. But he had an appointment to keep, and the oxygen tank was a demanding clock. So he dove right on past the old reef and out into the open waters, where the seabed couldn't be seen for many, many miles yet. The Maw, Reuben had said, 50,000 feet below the surface, Booker. 50,000. Do you know what that means? It means it's a whole hell of a lot deeper down there than the Challenger Abyss. He nodded at that. Are you ready to make history? Was he? He thought he was. He prepared for this lonely dive and nothing else for some years now. It was the culmination of a lifetime of work and study in the field. And so tight was its grip on his mind that he often dreamt of it in his sleep, of what he'd find at the bottom and what it would mean and what monstrous things might take offense to his presence there. No, no, he shoved that thought aside. Tuscany was all the protection he needed in that regard. It offered technology on the bleeding edge in lieu of a heavy hull. And that was enough to withstand enough water pressure to crush bones beneath skin and inches of steel. What animal had jaws more powerful than the ocean itself? So he hit the thrusters and down he went. He eyed the depth meter as much as he did the sea. 100 feet, 200. Sharks and turtles and uncountable fish swept past him. 300 feet, 700 feet. 1250, the inverse height of the Empire State Building. The water began to grain up and darken as the sunlight struggled to push on through. 2000, 3000, 32, where the light no longer shines. And soon, the only lights he had in order to illuminate the path ahead were those of the Tuscany. He'd continued the descent for hours. The pressure meter ticked up in spasmic bursts, soon ticking past the point where the weight of the sea would have crushed the steel of any other vessel. One mile down, 1.6, where even sperm whales hit their lowest dive. He could now claim with confidence that no mammal on earth was as deep at that very moment as himself. And still, he dove. 2.2 miles. The water was as black as space now, except for where the lights of the Tuscany pierced through it. Things were tight down there, despite the vastness of it all. 13,000 feet. The abyssal zone. Pressure stands at 11,000 psi. And he dove further. 3 miles. 3.1. Now, things get interesting. Mankind had visited these depths almost infrequently enough to count the expedition on a single pair of hands. He was now ranked among an illustrious few explorers, and although he wasn't the first to hit these marks, he'd hit the deepest one yet before this journey was over. 16,281.4 feet, nearly halfway to the world record. The Tuscany continued its dive. 20,000 feet down, the Haddle Zone. Pressure here is 1,100 times what it is at the surface. 29,000, the height of Mount Everest. 30, 31. The same distance as a commercial airline at the height of its flight. The Challenger Deep, what had previously been the lowest recorded place on the seabed, sat at roughly 36,000 feet below the surface, in the depths of the Mariana Trench. No light from the sun had ever come close, and to the best accounts, life existed there, but only sparsely, and the pressure is unspeakable. But Booker was going somewhere vastly deeper even than that. All we know is we found a canyon, Reuben had said. Dwarfs the Grand, sitting dead center in the Pacific seabed, about 1,200 kilometers west of Hawaii and another 900 south. And as far as we can figure, some 50,000 feet straight on down. 36,000 feet, he was now tied for the world record. 50,000 feet? Why the hell are we just now seeing it? 36.5, he did it. His heartbeat swept up to a faster rhythm. He was officially a world record holder. No human being in recorded history had been that deep below the surface. New seabed scanning technology helped, gave us a more detailed topographical map of the hydrosphere than we'd ever had before. 37. So what's down there? 37.3. Hell, doctor, if we knew, we wouldn't be sending you, would we? I suppose not. 38.5. Higgins Maw, according to the best information available to him at the time of departure, is a pit roughly a full kilometer across. It begins at approximately 46,000 feet below the surface and is estimated to bottom out at Higgins Deep, a small valley that sits at its base, some 5,000 additional feet below that. The Maw is the largest and deepest such formation in the hydrosphere, and yet its dimensions and location are the only things concretely known about it. That, of course, is where Booker and the Tuscany come in. 
He hit the floodlights underneath the Tuscany, and the glow washed over an alien landscape that likely hadn't seen light in over a billion years. There were mountains here, mountains that rivaled the Alps. He even saw life down there in its depths. A squid-like thing of simply monstrous size swam on the sub. It stopped for a moment, and during that moment, he thought it might take offense to him. But after looking hard at the Tuscany and brushing a tentacle down the port side, it swam off in search of other things. At a girl, said Booker, he descended further, 44,000 feet, 45, and then all of a sudden, there it was, the Maw. It was a breathtaking sight to behold, a monstrously large and equally dark hole in the crust of the earth that plummeted to inconceivable fathoms. He descended a bit further, 46,000 feet. Somehow things were even blacker in the depths of the thing, even though sunlight had long since been blotted out. 47. He began to become aware of a low current pulling him downward. It wasn't particularly powerful, but it was unexpected, and that's when he saw it, a glow. He squinted and dimmed his lights to confirm the intuition. What in the name of God? It was there indeed, a dimmish reddish purple, then green, then purple again, and then blue, floating on a mist of current some few thousand feet down. He resumed the dive to chase it. 49.5, 49.9. The glow, whatever it was, was getting deeper and wider and brighter. Soon, it lit up the whole path down and ahead. He dimmed the Tuscany's underlights to their lowest setting, and by 50, this cave isn't a straight pit. And sure enough, the hole bottomed out here, and then opened up to its left. Holy God, holy God, it was a cavern chamber, and only the enormity of its radius maintained the darkness of it despite the presence of thousands of floating bioluminescent pods that pulsed purple, green, and blue, then red, and dimmed in the interim. He took the Tuscany in deeper and her camera's word to life. The caverns became darker still when the pods faded into the water behind the ship, but there was more things to be seen here than rocks. Tuscany, about a quarter hour after entering the chamber, soon floated by a bizarrely rope-like plant of utterly impossible size, one that appeared to stretch nearly across the height of the cave and grew wider at the base. He took the submarine in for a closer inspection and hit her lights to their fullest setting. Clack! His heart dropped. There were suction cups on it, each one as big as the Tuscany herself, and they writhed and pulsed across and down the full length of what was now very clearly a tentacle. In panic, he shoved the Tuscany back and away from the thing, but when he tried to turn it around, the base of the hull collided with the beast and stuck fast to one of the cups. He gunned the thrusters and could hear a wet tearing sound as the machine ripped itself from the grasp of the cup. But then suddenly, the tentacle came to life. It whipped and whirled and smacked around the cavern and pressed itself to the roof, and then it fell down, deep beyond where the darkness blanketed the floor. Come on, baby! He hit the thrusters again and Tuscany rocketed off the way it came, through the darkness and off towards the pods, whose glow he hoped would afford him an opportunity to shut the lights off the ship and make his escape. If only he were so lucky, but very soon he began to hear and feel the movement of something unspeakably titanic rolling across the floor of the chamber. It rumbled and thundered and shuddered and shook. Soon, clouds of dirt and rock flew up out of the black pitch and blanketed the view forward. The sound erupted across the entire breadth of the cave at once. My eardrums nearly burst and likely would have had it not been for the muffling of the explosion provided by the walls of the Tuscany. The submarine shook, but she held up her integrity well enough for him to fly on past the floating pods towards the yawning mouth of the tunnel that would take me back out into the ocean deep. Smack! The Tuscany buckled and rolled with an impact. The tentacle, I realized, had shot up from the ground and hit the bottom of the ship between her ballast, but luckily it knocked her with force upwards towards the tunnel. He rolled the Tuscany with the hit and managed to regain some control, and he boosted the thrusters into the turn and up again. Now, back into the maw. Then he began to climb. 52,000 feet. 51.5. Come on, baby. Come on. Don't you fail me now. Don't you freaking fail me now. Tuscany ascended with panic speed, and all the while she did it, he could feel the rumbling of the tentacle's pursuit in the walls of the pit. It smashed its way on through the tunnel and whipped and thrashed, but the Tuscany was too quick a runner. 47, 46, climbing high. The Tuscany burst out of the maw and was about to rocket straight on back to the surface, but the tentacle flew out beside her, nearly smashed her in the front window. He bent the controls to the edge of their set casting, and the Tuscany tanked to the left and missed the ground by inches. He hit the lights again to navigate the labyrinth of rocks as he struggled to remount the climb. But in the light of the ship, he saw it. Those weren't rocks. Those were massive vessels, imperial warships from ages past, bent and crooked and broken at the bottom of the sea, pulled down here by whatever it was that now threw its back to my devouring. He took the Tuscany through this nautical graveyard with far, far too much speed for his safety. Under ship towers they went, and through cannon mounts, and past the blades of dead engines and around upended rudders. The entire ground for countless miles shook and rumbled with seismic force. It was thunderously loud, and it picked up speed and violence with time. The Tuscany flew up and headed upward. 44,000. Come on, you mother... <laughs>
The water itself seemed to shift with the sound, and then out of nowhere, the Tuscany was no longer the only thing spilling light to the abyss. An orange glow flashed across the sea, and for an instant illuminated nearly the entirety of its vastness. Then, it blinked. Then, it flicked on again and stayed active. He shut off the Tuscany's lights to preserve every molecule of power for the ascent. 44-2, 44-4. 44-3. Beside him, in the glow, he could make out other creatures retreating, ones of spectacular size, again, that mankind had never cataloged and that he sadly would not have time to at all study. There were city bus-sized manta ray-shaped things, wrapped up in cloud wisps of transparent jelly, and even that squid the size of a building, all flying upwards in a mass panic. He led the charge. <laughs> He looked behind him and down through the rear window. The mouth had moved. It was alive. God almighty, I was in the Leviathan's throat. I was in its damn throat. He saw its tentacle-like tongue lash out of the mouth and collect enough fish to feed a small town. The Tuscany rocketed ever upwards as the Leviathan whipped even larger tentacles behind it and gained speed with the force of a hurricane. The Leviathan opened its mouth yet again and spewed forward its tentacle-like tongue, and with it, it whipped up several Olympic swimming pools worth of water into a gale force maelstrom. As he ascended upwards, he noticed the giant squid he ran into earlier wasn't able to escape. He made it out of the whirlpool by just a foot. It snapped its mouth shut with a thunderous, echoing snap. The Leviathan pursued him relentlessly, riding on the flood of its own current. Its tentacles, each dozens of feet across, and at least a mile long, beat the water back and tried to gain speed for their host. <laughs> the Tuscany's speed proved worthy, as he was now at 27,000 feet, but the Leviathan did not give up chase. He could feel it doubling its efforts. The displaced water rocked the Tuscany, and she buckled and rolled in the synthetic current. Then, he heard the maw open up behind him and the water began to whip and swirl into a frenzy by the ocean load. He punched the thrusters to the breaking point. Come on! The reinforced glass began to chip ever so slightly. The chips broke into cracks, and those cracks began to crawl across the width of the window. He checked the gauges. 20,000 feet. 19. 19.3. The ascent was slowing. Come on, baby! Come on, come on, come on! Please, God! Be with me now! Be! In the orange glow of the Leviathan's eyes, he could see how quickly the water was slipping by the Tuscany and getting swept up into the maelstrom. The submarine began to sway port to starboard and shudder and shake. He watched the gauge with nauseating desperation. 15.95, 15.92, come on, come on, come on! 15.925, 15.924, shoot! And that was it. The Tuscany was caught. No sooner did the depth chart begin to slip than did he feel the whole sensation of the submarine lose all sense of control and tumble backwards and around. He was thrown out of his seat and smacked his nose against the roof of the pilot's sphere. Bloodshot everywhere. He grabbed his face and began to apply pressure, hoping to slow the blood loss. But the Tuscany again flipped ballast over ballast to starboard in the whirlpool and spilled him into the hatch ladder. He felt his shoulder dislocate and his kneecap smack into the bottom rung. His head swam and still the Tuscany tumbled backwards. The cracks were spreading faster. He could smell the inside of the beast's mouth through the hull of the ship. But then, all at once, and not a moment too soon, he got an idea. It wasn't a good one, but better than nothing. He managed to limp and tumble his way through the controls and grip the handles as the ship rolled. Wait for it, wait for it. Now! The sound of the roar was so close every last control surface in the sphere rattled in its case. But then he flared up the thrusters, full blast, and at an angle. And the Tuscany shuddered and flipped and shook, and with fortune, fell straight out of the maelstrom, with just inches to spare. The Leviathan's maw grazed the starboard side, and the impact sent him into the roof while the ship rolled end over end again. He smacked his ribs up on the dip in the alcove and fell back down into his seat head first, and then fell onto the floor. He was free, but only just. The Tuscany tumbled, banked, and rolled, slower now in absence of the whirlpool's flood current. He tried to steer away, but it was useless. The ship flipped around the back of the Leviathan's titanic maw and up over its head as the beast flew on by underneath him like a freight train. And for the first time since catching its eye, he began to fully appreciate the magnitude of this monster's size. Its back was an endless snake-like and sharp fin spine the size of a minor mountain range. And only quick maneuvering moved the Tuscany away from the jagged back fins that chugged up towards him and sliced open the sea itself. The current they'd swept up sent the submarine reeling backwards off a bit further and into relative safety. He quickly dimmed the lights to their lowest setting and caught his breath as the full form of the Leviathan washed on past him. It stretched far away into the abyss below, for well over a mile, and dragging away behind it were thousands upon thousands of tentacles, a forest of the things, each the size of a six-lane highway and tipped with razor-sharp hooks, and a flurry of wing fins. It took a full three minutes for the beast to pass by him fully, and then it curved around in the other direction and swam off in search of other things to devour. Then it was gone. He surfaced hours later, having allowed the battered Tuscany to take its time with the journey. She was solely responsible for his escape. A marvel of engineering indeed. Once he did break the surface, he dispersed a distress beacon and then promptly collapsed from exhaustion. He was picked up by the Coast Guard some hours after that, a few hundred miles southwest of Hawaii, and pulled from the near wreckage of his submarine. He was taken to a hospital in Hawaii where he recovered. 
During his recovery, he heard isolated chatter of a tremendous seismic activity near where he'd been, and how the whole ocean floor had changed and moved and shifted form. But he couldn't care less. He told the bastards what he knew. And on top of that, they have the Tuscany and they have all the recorded evidence. And you now have this written account. What everyone does with this information now is entirely up to them. As far as Booker, he won't be doing any diving anytime soon. He's come to the realization that mankind has more than enough space to expand throughout and live upon and thrive in, above, and near the surface and on land. But there are things in the sea that hold ownership of the deep, and perhaps it's best to leave it that way for all of our sake. Stay in love, stay in light, be kind to others, and stay tuned. I am out.